what's up everybody welcome back first off i want to wish you all a happy black history month this month let us celebrate the contributions of our black brothers and sisters let this be a month of exploration discovery and preservation of the stories that make up our diverse nation i'm will and this is the people's health in the last two episodes we discussed the history of redlining in america from what it was to how it influenced other redlining-like policies enacted after it was ended by the passage of the Fair Housing Act in 1968. For a short history of redlining in America, be sure to check out episode four linked right here. Our last episode, episode five, delves deeper into the examples of redlining-like legislation passed after the Fair Housing Act, such as the federal housing policies like urban renewal and transportation policies like the Federal Interstate Highway Act of 1956. These housing and transportation policies demolished urban neighborhoods in this country and have largely contributed to financial and political divestment from black, indigenous, people of color, or BIPOC communities. According to a study published in the Environmental Justice Journal, Taken together, redlining, housing, transportation, and other urban policy ushered in white flight from cities, the widespread displacement of vibrant urban neighborhoods of color, and decades of urban decline. In this episode, we're gonna look at how communities that have been historically linked to redlining continue to suffer from various health inequities, how health disparities detrimentally impacted these communities, and finally, how those disparities were widened due to COVID-19. This is episode six, how redlining is still harming communities. Strap in as we explore the connection between redlining and public health. Let's go. While racial discriminatory practices and segregation have been illegal in the United States for a long time, the long-term effects of redlining and other policies like it continue to take a toll on the health of individuals in different communities, particularly those of color. Redlining. Well, not actually being a red line on your sidewalk separating one community from another, it might as well be. A quick recap in case you haven't watched the previous two episodes for a little background on redlining, here's the gist of it. Redlining was a discriminatory practice by which banks, insurance companies, and others refuse or limit loans, mortgages, and insurance within specific geographic areas. It was based on a loan risk system developed by the feds that incorporated a color coding system where descriptions like high infiltration of Negroes deemed an area hazardous. I know I hit on this last time, but yes, it really said infiltration. Now the areas were shaded green indicating best, blue indicating still desirable, yellow indicating definitely declining, and red indicating hazardous. Now that you know that, perhaps this is as good a time as any to talk about such topics. This moment, where the consciousness of the nation seems to be leaning towards social justice. What better time than now to expose the health inequities resulting from racist policies such as redlining and other related practices. Fortunately, there is now a whole lot of research that details the legacy of redlining and similar policies on housing residential segregation, as well as research concerning environmental justice relating to disparities persistent in poverty and wealth creation, access to healthy food, mass incarceration, gun violence, qualities of green space, concentration of pollution, heat island, and overall determinants of health. It shouldn't be understated how redlining is as clear an example as any of structural racism that concentrates risks and in many ways limits opportunities for communities of color. In the study mentioned earlier, nine cities historically linked to redlining, which included San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, Cleveland, St. Louis, Atlanta, Miami, and New York City were analyzed. These cities were chosen to reflect but not represent four different geographic regions in the United States. Using redlining maps, census data, CDC health outcome data, and income and demographic data from the American Community Survey, the study looked to associate each respective city to seven specific health outcomes. These health outcomes included the estimated prevalence of asthma, cancer, coronary heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, poor mental health, and stroke. In the study, LA's Association of Redlining and Health Outcomes was told through six images. First, Los Angeles HOLC's redlining map, together with the digitized version. Next, the LA map adjusted to the 2010 census tract still containing the color-coded indicators. Let's compare the map to first, asthma prevalence, then cancer prevalence, then diabetes prevalence. Notice the similarities. All right, all right, all right, let's backtrack a bit. 
What are census tracts? A census tract is an area roughly equivalent to a neighborhood established by the Census Bureau for analyzing population. Now where were we? In the end, the data, while somewhat limited, suggested a strong association between health and redlining. It contained findings such as intergenerational traumas that may contribute to both the presence of physical exposures or concentration of hazards, but also the psychological stress that is usually associated with low socioeconomic status. This study cast a wide net, but it is part of a collection of studies that identify a clear association between redlining and health outcomes. Like a study conducted by the University of California, Berkeley, and the University of California, San Francisco, where an investigation was conducted into redlined communities, showing that the residents of communities that were redlined faced greater health risks than others where redlining did not occur. This is San Francisco and Oakland. These are the HOLC maps for both cities. In their digitized version, side-by-side -side comparison, the HOLC security maps on the left indicated yellow as declining and red as hazardous zones. The map on the right showed darker shades of purple indicating higher asthma-related emergency room visits for 10,000 residents. But again, similar findings. Another study published in the Journal of American Public Health Association looked at whether redlined communities in New York City were associated with increased risk of preterm birth. For the for purposes of the study, preterm was identified as less than 37 weeks. The study found that historical redlining may be a structural determinant of present day risk of preterm birth. It studied 528,098 single births in New York City from 2013 to 2017. 36,902 of those, or 7%, were determined to be preterm. The highest number of preterm births was found in zones marked as yellow at 14,098, or 38% and red at 11,263, or 30%, of all preterm single births in those years. To highlight the disparities a bit further, the number of premature births in green or best zones was 274, or 0.7%. Crazy, huh? There are several other studies indicating the same association with redlining and detrimental health outcomes in American cities. I encourage anyone who's interested to use academic search sites such as Google Scholar, Microsoft Academic, PubMed, or ResearchGate, among others, to just dive in. You can also just Google redlining and health in your city and start there. Guaranteed, you either be mad or glad you did it. In 2020, the National Community Reinvestment Coalition released a report titled Redlining and Neighborhood Health. According to the report, today, those same neighborhoods, meaning ones associated with historical redlining, suffer not only from reduced wealth and greater poverty, but also from life expectancy and higher incidence of chronic diseases that are risk factors for poor outcomes from COVID-19. This report found that there were statistically significant associations between redlining and pre-existing conditions like asthma, COPD, diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, kidney disease, obesity, and stroke. All of these conditions create an elevated risk of death from COVID-19. It also found statistically significant associations between greater redlining and general indicators of population health, such as increased prevalence of poor mental health and lower life expectancy. The report ends with this. Local communities will need to engage and be allowed to tailor these policies to fit their unique situation. But we must start with the understanding that segregation, a product of structural racism and all of the negative impacts that it imparts, it is a choice we make daily. We can choose to be better. So that was episode six, how redlining is still harming communities. The issues associated with communities historically linked to redlining and disparities that exist within them are vast. Equity-based reforms are necessary to fight against the ways in which structural racism persists in the operations of the housing market and education, the criminal justice system, the healthcare system, in the workplace, and overall in this country. In the next episode, we're gonna look at the other side of gentrification by exploring the detrimental health effects of gentrification policies. If you have anything you wanna share, including topics you might wanna see explored on this channel, don't forget to leave a comment below. Also, more importantly, do not forget to subscribe, click the bell for notifications on new episodes, and of course, like this video. Check us out in a couple of weeks. I'm Will, and this is The People's Health. Remember, take care of yourselves and each other. Peace.